Learning about computers can feel like memorizing a long list of facts. It is often taught top down with a figure of authority dishing out factoids like they're hotcakes. Computers think in zeros and ones. There's register and main memory. And that's it. Always been at war with East Asia. To the curious mind, that style of teaching can be frustrating because one can't help but wonder why. Why is it that way and not some other way? And if what you're trying to do by teaching is to establish dogma, a set of beliefs accepted by members of a group without being questioned or doubted, then you don't need to trouble yourself with those questions. You can just plow ahead you can, and spread the good word and simply cast aside anyone who doesn't accept them outright. But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to set fire to your mind. I'm encouraging you to experiment and have fun with things you might have previously thought mundane. I'm trying to spark more and more questions until finally it's me you question and that sets us down the path of my inevitable cancellation. Because the truth of the matter is, these facts being handed down in most courses are not so much facts as they are opinions. Very little about them is dictated by intrinsic limitations of the physical world we live in. Some are. I mean, for a while now, we've been trying to make computers smaller, not just so they're portable, but also because we must consider how long it takes for an electrical signal to travel from one point to another. And the limit we're currently hitting is, I believe, the sheer amount of heat dissipated on every clock cycle. There's also transmission delays and a bunch of other constraints, which explains why the record for highest CPU clock rate, 8.72 GHz with liquid nitrogen cooling, hasn't been beaten since 2014. But other facts are not. They're conventions we've agreed on as a society because they were convenient. Sometimes for no particularly good reason, most of the world agrees that this should be called ananas. Say for the British, who looked at it and went, I don't know mate, it feels more like a pineapple to me. That's the correct name for it, just different options. As long as you and I both agree what it's called, we can communicate, we can work together, play together, we can live as a society. And one fundamental concept that analyzes large parts of society and computers both is numbers. So let's talk about numbers. Individual numbers exist besides their name. I like to think of them as inhabiting a number line. If we only consider natural numbers, whole numbers zero or above, we can draw an arrow like this. Now, in reality, it keeps on going forever in that direction, but my diagram stops somewhere so it will fit on your screen. Drawing marks at regular intervals is all we need to describe natural numbers. I can point at any of these, and if we're looking at the same diagram, there's no ambiguity as to which number I'm referring to. However, Having to carry a physical number line with you everywhere you go is maybe not the most practical approach. It would be extremely convenient, convenient convention, those both come from the same Latin word. Etymology. It would be extremely convenient to have names for them. And while you could try and come up with a unique name for every number on the line, that one's John, this one's Mary, and now we have Podrick. The problem is the line goes on forever. And on average, an adult native English speaker only has about 42,000 words in their vocabulary. So you need something else. You need a scheme. The simplest one is probably to represent numbers as tally marks. If you have two somethings, you draw two marks. If you have five, you draw five marks and so on and so forth. You can even get creative and make groups of five that make a shape if you want. This works and we call that a unary numeral system. It's completely fine if you're just using a wall to keep track of how many days you've been stuck inside, for example. Unless you're living through an unprecedented worldwide pandemic, in which case you're going to want something a little more efficient. And that's where positional notation comes in, also called place value notation or positional numeral systems. First, you need to make up a bunch of digits, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And that gives you names for the first few numbers. And to name the numbers after that, you just string digits together. But as digits move to the left, their value is multiplied by the amount of digits you have in your system, the base. And if your base is 10, which as a human you might want to pick because that's the average amount of fingers humans have on their hands, you've got decimal. 
If we compare the number 11 in unary and decimal, we can see the difference. All the ones in the unary notation are worth the same, just one. Whereas in decimal, the one on the right is worth one, it's the least significant digit, but the one on the left is worth 10, the most significant digit. And I know what you're thinking. What about Roman numerals? Well, they are, one, different for no good reason, two, arguably worse, and three, designed by people who clearly didn't know any better. Just like Plan 9 assembly. No, but for real, Roman numerals are simply definitive proof that you can have god-awful opinions and still be widely successful. For a time. I'm not saying Roman numerals, which they basically stole from the Etruscans anyway, I'm not saying they caused the decline of the Roman Empire, but I'm also not not saying it. The neat thing with positional numeral systems is that we can pick any base we want. Which is to say, we can decide to come up with however many symbols we want. If we pick base 2, we have two symbols, and that's binary. If we pick base 3, we have three symbols, that's ternary or trinary. Base 8 is octal, base 10 is decimal, we've seen that one. Base 16 is hexadecimal. Binary digits are called bits, so as before, we've got the most significant bit on the left, worth 8, and the least significant bit, LSB, on the right, worth just 1. And again, that's just a convention, it's just something we agreed on as a society. Even bi-directional languages like Hebrew, Arabic, or Persian write numbers left to right, with the most significant digit on the left. But we could have just as well settled on the reverse convention. Hmm. I wonder if that same problem will come up again later in the video. But one question remains unanswered. Why would we bother with any base other than 10? Why use anything other than decimal? I'm, I'm, I'm getting to it. In binary, each digit or bit has two possible values, 0 and 1. And that's really useful if we consider how we would go about storing data on a physical medium. Let's say all we have is a strip of paper and a pencil. And we could split our strip into intervals, and at every interval, if we make a pencil mark, it's a 1, and if we don't, it's a 0. If we need to store more data on the paper strip, we can just make the interval smaller, bringing the marks closer together. However, eventually the marks are going to start bleeding into each other, and it'll become unreadable. And when we've made intervals as small as we can, without sacrificing readability, we have reached the limit of information density for our storage medium. And that's exactly how data storage works on tape. Except we do several tracks, one of which is parity for error detection, and instead of pencil marks, it's magnetic fields in one direction or the other. Same principle for floppy disk and hard disk drives, except now the tracks are circular. And CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays and all the other godforsaken formats in between, those have actual little physical pits on them underneath a protective layer, and we use freaking lasers to read and write them. Now there's too many interesting things to say about data storage, so let's back up. The point is, Binary makes sense there, because it indicates one of two states, whether it's a pit or no pit, or whether a magnetic field is in one direction or the other. But there's only so many things we can describe with zeros and ones. At some point, we might want to describe other things, like characters, letters, numbers, punctuation, etc. So, we might decide that it's pretty handy to consider those bits by groups of 8 instead, that gives us an octet. And because this video is part of a series about x86 architecture, I am going to use the words octet and byte interchangeably moving forward, even though not all bytes are 8 bits. So, bytes. Those are super neat because they have 256 different values, so we can definitely fit 26 letters, all digits from 0 to 9, and have plenty of room left over. We can even establish a convention or a standard for which values mean which characters. And we could call it American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII for short. You can see in this table here, we reserved a few characters for white space, control sequences, plus, minus, star, dash, etc. That version of ASCII was published in 1967, but it too is one of many different opinions. Before ASCII, there was EBCDIC, which IBM adapted from punched card code in the early 60s, and is pretty much the character encoding equivalent of Roman numerals at this point. Luckily, everyone has migrated away from EBCDIC a long time ago, and <laughs> if only it worked like that. In 2019, a Belgian resident raised a GDPR complaint to get their bank to spell their name correctly, umlaut and all. The bank's defense was pretty much, well, Absidic won't let us do that, so I mean... But the Court of Appeal of Brussels found in favor of the resident in a decision including this glorious quote, 
A correctly functioning banking institution may be expected to have computing systems that meet current standards, including the right to correct spelling of people's names. All right, let's zoom out again. We, we had bits with two possible values, and now we have bytes, technically octets, which are eight bits in a trench code and can have 256 different values. Using hexadecimal, we only need two digits, two nibbles, to write down the value of a byte. Zero is just zero, zero. 16 is 10, 139 is 8b, 162 is a2, 231 is e7, 255 is fa. What if we want to count bigger values, though? Well, maybe we put two bytes together and we call that a word. Again, over the course of history, many different architectures, many different word sizes, but we're on x86, and so for us, a word is two bytes or 16 bits. Next question. How many possible values in a word? It's time for combinatorics. If we have a set S of k elements, the number of n tuples over S is k to the nth power. Here, our set S has two elements, 0 and 1, and if we say our words have 16 bits, each word is a 16 tuple. So the number of 16 tuples over a set of size 2 is 2 to the 16th power, which is 65,536. Now we're talking. Now those are numbers that justify building computers to work with. Because I don't know about you, but I can't add 12,593 and 32,912 in my head. I mean, I probably could. But it's a lot more fun to build an ALU instead, which stands for Arithmetic Logic Unit, that can add those numbers for me. And multiply them, and divide them, and so on. And once we start thinking about that, we've opened Pandora's box. Because we have so many choices to make. And it starts simple, just like we've done with bytes. Let's look at a few numbers and how we'd put them into words. 16-bit words, that is. So zeros are still zeros, that's good. 16 is still one zero in hexadecimal, we've just padded the left with zeros. And for bigger numbers, we have four nibbles. 10,000 is hex 2710, and so on. But there's another option here. Just like we had a most significant bit and a least significant bit, we also now have most and least significant bytes. Here, I've chosen to write those numbers as big endian with the most significant byte on the left, but actually x86 CPUs prefer to think in little endian. But why little endian? Why would you put the least significant byte first in memory? It feels backwards to anyone who hasn't already accepted that as a fact of life. To understand why little endian, we must turn back time some 50 years. In 1969, Computer Terminal Corporation tasked Intel with designing a chip for one of their CRT terminals. CTC later became DataPoint and then bankrupt. They didn't even end up using the chip, which eventually got released as the Intel 8008. But because of DataPoint's original requirements, they unknowingly dictated one of the biggest decisions in computing history. All because other components inside their terminals employed a bit serial design. They expected numbers to come in on a single line, bit by bit. One of the ways we humans add numbers on paper is by doing long addition. Say we want to add 35 and 97, we just write them on their own line, right aligned, and then we'd go column by column, starting from the right, so 5 plus 7 equals 12, we put down the 2 in the answer line and carry the 1, then we add 1, 3, and 9, that's 13, so put down the 3, carry the 1, and finally we have just 1, so we put it down. Just like that, we got our answer, 35 plus 97 is 132. Now we just did long addition in decimal in base 10, but it works just as well in other bases. In fact, we can do that same addition in base 2. Each column is now a bit, 0 or 1, instead of a decimal digit, 0 to 9. As you can see, we get the exact same answer. But there's one interesting constraint with long addition. You must go right to left. You must start with the least significant bit. You cannot do it the other way around. And if you're trying to make a machine that can add numbers, it's a perfectly fine choice to have it work on bits one at a time, adding them as they come in and keeping track of the carry bit as long as they come in least significant bit first. And that would be a bit serial processor, the kind DataPoint was putting in their terminal. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does that have anything to do with the Intel 8008, which is an 8-bit processor? First thing I want to say is, calling something an 8-bit processor is kind of misleading. 
And it's not the whole story. It is true that the 8008's main registers were 8-bit wide. But even with this tiny early chip, you could have more memory than 256 bytes. So memory addresses could not be 8-bit, otherwise you would have run out of address space. Is that, is that nonsense? The, the address space is just how many names you have for places. Every byte is a place and it needs a unique name. So if you only have 256 names, you can only ever address 256 bytes. Now the 8008 was actually supposed to have a 16-bit address space, two bytes for every address, but because the designers were forced to make it fit in an 18-pin package, already more than the 16-pin packages Intel was so fond of, they had to scale that down to 14-bit. So how much memory can we address with that? Well, we already know how to do that. How many 14 tuples are there over a set of size 2? 16,384, or 16 kilobytes of memory. Not kilobytes, that would be 16,000. Kilos are powers of 10, and kbs are powers of 2. So with the 8008, you need two bytes to refer to a place in memory. And that kind of sparked a discussion between Intel and Datapoint. Intel was like, this chip we're making for you, it might just get some use beyond CRT terminals. Now, we, we want to make it byte parallel, which would mean sending all eight bits at the same time on eight different pins. But Datapoint was like, but everything is bit serial. It, it expects data bit after bit on a single pin, starting from the least significant bit. And so Intel was like, fine, God. All right, we're, we're keeping it byte parallel, but you can have the least significant byte first. That way you can send the low 8 bits serially and then the high 8 bits and it all works out. And you know what? It did kind of work out. Because at the time, a bunch of memory modules were 256 by 8, like this one here. It can store 256 8-bit values, hence the name. Now, how would one go about using one of these? Well, first you would need to select which byte you want to read by sending an 8-bit value in parallel to pins 80 through 87, 80 for address. And then the output comes out of, wait, we got pin for power, pin for ground, read, write, and oh, we don't have enough pins. So I guess we have to share the same pins between the address lines and the data lines. Okay, so we write our address to 80 0 through 87, and then we tell the chip to latch onto that address using the ALE pin for address latch enable. And then we stop sending the address and ask to read the memory with the RD pin for read, and the data comes out of pins 80 0 through 87. Problem solved. And so we need to store more than 256 bytes. Then we need multiple chips and a way to select which chip we're talking to. Now we could, we could kind of multiplex these chips, like have some kind of controller between them and the processor that would route the reads and writes to specific chips depending on the address, but that sounds really expensive and like something we'll worry about inventing later. Another option would be to have all the chips be wired together, except for the chip select pins marked as CS123 on the diagram. And that's where the little engine thing works beautifully. Because you get the address in two parts. First, the low 8 bits, and you inject that straight into the address lines of all your RAM chips. And you make them latch onto that address with the ALA pin, so now every chip remembers what byte it is you want. And then later, you get the high 8 bits, and you use those to inhibit control lines for every RAM chip except the one you want. And finally, you ask for a read using the RD line, which again is shared across all chips, and only the chip that was selected will respond on the shared address slash data lines. Isn't that kind of cool, how it all worked out? Well, kind of. Except the 8008 was the first of many processors in that family tree. The Ryzen 9 I have in this computer is also using little engine byte ordering because of data point. Now, we didn't jump from one to the other. There were plenty of intermediates. The 8086 had 16-bit registers, but a 20-bit address bus. It could add larger numbers and address a full megabyte of memory. Then we had the 286, which had a 24-bit address bus, able to, in theory, address 16 megabytes of memory. Then the 386, which had 32-bit registers, double words, and a 32-bit address bus, able to, again, in theory, address 4 gigabytes of RAM. The 386 was a huge success. It was produced by Intel until 2007. That was yesterday, 15 years ago.
And then eventually we got processors with 64-bit registers, but only a 48-bit address bus, which means for now, you can only install as much as 256 terabytes of memory on your computer. In practice, though, good luck finding a consumer motherboard that lets you install more than 256 gigabytes of RAM. And that is the story of computers. Well, numbers in the context of computers, natural numbers, some computers. But I mean, we're missing huge chunks of the picture here. So we can represent large numbers, big, what, what, what can we do with them? Well, we can make a program that has a list of instructions that tells the processor what to do with those numbers. And that program lives in RAM, just like the numbers. Now we already know how to lay out the numbers in memory, whether they're one, two, four, or eight bytes, we just put them down in little engine order, thanks data point. But how do we encode instructions? What do we write to memory to tell the computer to do things? Well, I don't know, not off the top of my head, because there's a lot of different instructions and the encoding is not trivial. Partly because there's a lot of history and backwards compatibility involved as we've seen with the 8008, and partly because the encoding tries to be space efficient. The instructions should take as few bytes as possible. It's like a challenge. If possible, off to use instructions should be shorter than the others. And if some instructions need numbers, we should try to reserve only as many bytes as we need. We don't want to spend eight bytes on a value that would fit in just two. And that all sounds okay, but we've had a lot of theory today. I feel like we could use a little example as a treat, just to make sure that what I'm telling you here is rooted in reality. Now, as I said, I don't know how to write machine code by heart, but I do know how to write assembly, a little, just enough to be dangerous. And then I know how to ask an assembler to assemble that assembly into machine code. And then we can just look at that. What's cool when you write assembly is that you get to decide pretty much exactly how it's gonna go down. So here, I want the computer to do the same addition we did earlier in decimal binary. So we'll just make a data section with two global symbols with distinctive names like Alex and June so we can find them later. And now we need to see what's inside of them. So for Alex, we'll declare a quad word, D for declare, Q for quad with value 35. And same for June, DQ with value 97. Then we'll have a text section, which will contain actual code. We'll have a global fun symbol to make this a little less scary. And in there, we'll put some instructions. So I want to add Alex and June, but right now they're just in RAM somewhere. Well, not yet, but when the program runs, they'll be in RAM. I'll show you. So first we need to move them from RAM to some registers, which we can do with move. The brackets mean to copy what's at that address, not copy the address itself. So after that, we'll have 35 in the RAX registers and 97 in the RCX register. You'll notice the destination actually comes first here. And the reason here again is someone picked one of the two options. Now don't worry though, there's another very popular syntax for assembly where it's the other way around. As usual with computers, if there's two options, you can be pretty sure there'll be folks on either side of the problem claiming that their option is so much better. Then we'll add RAX with RCX. And again, the destination is on the left. So really you can think of it as RAX equals RAX plus RCX. And then we return, which, um, right. I haven't explained function calls yet or the stack. Well, functions are just symbols. that just an address in memory where there's instructions. Calling a function is like getting distracted. Let's say you're watching this video and suddenly you get thirsty. So you now have a new task, getting a glass of water. It's like you're pushing that new task on a stack of things you have to do. So you get up, go get a glass, come back, and then you pop that task off your stack and resume the video. And that's pretty much how function calls work. When a function is called, we're telling the processor, hey, jump over to that location to execute some other instructions. But we also wanna be able to return to whatever it is we were doing before calling that function. So we push a return address on the stack and that red instruction right there, it just pops the return address off the stack and jumps back to it. Okay, now we can assemble that with Yasm and that gives us an object file. And to find out the encoding for those instructions, we can disassemble it again with objdump. Now I'll use a bunch of flags here. So dash D for disassemble, dash W for wide format, dash T for symbol table, dash M Intel for disassembler options. And now we can see all our instructions, two moves, one add and a ret. Returning from a function is a very common operation. So you can see it only takes up one byte. 
Adding two registers is three bytes, as for the moves, they take up an entire eight bytes. There's something a little fishy about those moves though. The disassembly says move into racks quad word pointer at offset zero into the data segment. Offset zero. Now, I, I don't pretend to know where Alex and June are in memory, but I'm fairly sure they should be at different locations because they're two distinct variables. So surely that cannot work. But I mean, who knows, let's try it anyway. We'll make a small C program that'll just call fun. I really don't want to spend too much time talking about C. Suffice to say, yes, that is how you handle unsigned 64-bit integer values portably in C. In essence, all we're saying here is by the time this is an executable, there will be a fun symbol, we'll be able to call it, it will return an unsigned 64-bit integer, so please call it and print its return value. If we build that program with a C compiler like Clang, it'll complain about an undefined reference to fun. That's because we broke our promise. We said there would be a symbol named fun, but we never provided it. We've declared it in fun.c, but it's actually defined in fun.o, the output of yasm. If we call nm fun.o, we can see all that it defines. It has Alex and June marked as D for initialized data, and fun as T for text, which is code. So let's compile our fun.c program again, but this time we'll pass fun.o to Clang as well. And now it compiles, it even runs, and it gets the same answer we got when we did long addition by hand. But wait, when we looked at the disassembly, it was referring to offset zero from the data segment. So how does that even work? Let's disassemble the fun symbol again, but from the executable this time. Oh, hey, it's not zero anymore. We see two distinct offsets here, 404024 and 4042C. If we look for the Alex and June symbols in the executable, we can see the addresses match up. And if we run fun in a debugger and read from those memory locations, we find our values 35 and 97 again. So what happened? Why was the offset zero in the object file, but it was non-zero in the executable? Well, that's because when we're assembling fun.asm into an object file, we don't know where it'll end up, our C code also gets compiled into an object file, and then we link both these objects together to make an executable. It's during that link phase that sections from different objects are merged. See, just as we specified, fun.o has two sections, text and data. And if we dump the whole data section, we see our two values as little endian hexadecimal. As for the executable, it has a bunch more sections, but it also has text and data. Again, if we dump that data section, we can see our values are there, just offset by four bytes. The reason the move instructions in our object file have offset zero is because we don't know where Alex and June will be in the final product, not until link time. If we add two global variables in our C file, it pushes Alex and June back. Before, everything in the data section came from fun.asm, and now there's stuff from both fun.c and from fun.asm. The addresses for Alex and June have changed. So the move instruction needs to be fixed up at link time. It's almost as if there's some information we're not seeing in the disassembly that tells the linker, see this offset? It's zero right now, but later it needs to be the address of wherever that symbol ended up. And that's exactly such a thing. It's called relocations. Hi, Unscripted Amos coming at you here real quick. Imagine you're writing a pick your own adventure book where you get to make choices like, if you want to talk to the man in blue, turn to page 12. If you want to just open the box, uh, turn to page 17. Imagine you're writing such a book and so you have a draft. You have kind of an idea of what you want to put in the book, you, what kind of interactions there can be. So you want a secret treasure that you can find and you want alligators that can eat the protagonist um, but you don't know where they're going to be yet. So when you write the book, when you write the draft, you don't write turn to page 12 because this, you don't know what's going to be on page 12 yet. So you write turn to page gators. And then once you have the complete map of everything that can happen in the book, you can just replace turn to page alligator with turn to page 12 because that's where the alligators end up in the book. And that's exactly what happens with revocations. It's not much more to it. If we disassemble fun.o again, but add dash r for relocation, 
we can see what's going on. Those relocations are processed at link time, and everything is fixed up according to their final location in the executable. Unless it's a position independent executable, and then there's also relocations happening at startup, processed by the runtime dynamic linker. Hi, Unscripted Amos again. I don't have a good analogy of what position independent executables would mean for pick your own adventure books. But I do have a whole series about it in my blog. If you think these video series are going too slow or why are taking so much time to explain numbers, we already know how numbers work. Good news, you can just go read like hours of the nitty gritty details of how an executable is actually being run. And it goes much further, much deeper because I'm not trying to make them as accessible as I'm trying to do these videos. So if you wanna go read them, just go on my website there. And that's everything. I think. No, no, it's not. We didn't really look at how x86 instructions are encoded. We took the easy way out and just called an assembler and looked at the output. But what does each individual byte in 48.8b0425 mean? Well, it's complicated. Looking at the bytes is not enough for this. We need to look at individual bits. 48 is a rex prefix. We need it because our operands are 64 bit wide. Even though our values fit in a single byte, we reserved an entire eight bytes for each of them. Rex prefixes start with a fixed bit pattern 0, 1, 0, 0, and then we have W set to one to indicate 64 bit operands, then R, X, and B, which are used later. 8B actually means move. Well, one flavor of move, there's several. 04 is a mod RM byte. It contains a 2-bit mod value set to 00, a 3-bit reg value set to 000, and a 3-bit RM value set to 100. Finally, we have 25, an SIB byte. It contains a 2-bit scale value, a 3-bit index value, and a 3-bit base value. To know which register we're moving to, our destination, we take the R bit from regs and the three reg bits from mod RM, which make 0.000, and that means regs. Similarly, if we take mod x index b base all together and look at what they mean, they mean our second operand is a 32-bit address, and that's exactly what follows as little engine 24 40 40 0, 0. Simple, right? No, it's not. It's not simple. In fact, it's the most contrived up is down arcane doesn't fit in your brain encoding I know of. It's worse than Epsidic. The good news is. Any other encoding we learn after that will seem so much simpler in comparison. Because yes, there's more. You see, the reason I've been trying to teach all of this and what we'll be building towards over the course of many videos is Mon petit oiseau a pris sa volée Mon petit oiseau a pris sa volée A pris sa, a la volette, a pris sa la branche était sèche et le s'est cassé. La branche était sèche et le s'est cassé. Et le s'est à la volette, et le s'est à la volette, et le s'est cassé.